food industry in the Hills District by the 1880s uh, was very extensive and in fact it was probably the largest in New South Wales. Uh, the problem was that uh, getting it to market was dependent on horse-drawn road lorries. Uh, and uh, the roads were terrible, they hadn't progressed, and uh, it sometimes took up to a day uh, to get the fruit from uh, uh, the orchard to places such as Pennant Hills, Parramatta or Seven Hills for loading onto trains to get it into Sydney to market. Uh, so there was this desperate need for, for transport improvement. Uh, to the rescue, to some extent, was uh, a railway that was proposed from Clyde to Dural. Um, it was um, created by private entrepreneurs and uh, it unfortunately only got as far as Carlingford before uh, the entrepreneurs ran out of money. Uh, there was also a private proposal uh, to put a, a tramway in a very early tramway from Castle Hill down to Parramatta, join it onto the George Street line and uh, uh, the fruit would then be uh, transported along the George Street line and lighted from uh, Red Bank down to, uh, down to Sydney. Uh, that didn't get off the ground either. The steam trams in Sydney becoming surplus to requirements on account of electrification that was taking place about, oh, from about 1898 onwards. Uh, so after much lobbying, uh, we find ourselves with uh, approval being given to, to lay a tramway in uh, from Parramatta to Borkham Hills as a first start. Uh, and of course the orchards were very happy that this was going to be a means for them to get their fruit uh, from at least Borkham Hills to start with uh, into the markets. Um, by 1902 uh, the, the line had been laid in and it was uh, open to the public on uh, the 18th of August 1902. The fly in the ointment was however that uh, the track that was laid from Parramatta Station uh, to the Woolen Mills was grooved rail that would not fit railway wagons. Uh, and so were all the points and crossovers on the line. Uh, it meant that railway wagons could not go over those sections of line and also uh, there was a legal impediment to carrying goods on the line in any case. So after all this lobbying had taken place uh, by the fruit growers etc etc it turned out the long and the short of it was that the tramway couldn't carry goods i.e. the fruit on the line. So it turned out to be a totally different purpose in the end to what it was originally contemplated. It just turned out to be a passenger carrier rather than a goods carrier. Fares on the tram were a penny a section um, it, uh, and a through fare to Borkham Hill. Uh, the, the line to Borkham Hills was divided up into four sections and um, for a through ticket to Borkham Hills cost you threepence. The tram uh, started out providing uh, some, some very interesting services um, considering the times like um, uh, not long after it, uh, it started it, it uh, commenced with carrying um, letters and there was a letter box placed on the back of the tram and you could go up to your local tram stop and the tram would be coming along um, and you'd be standing there with your, your, your letter and the tram would stop and you'd pop your letter in the letter box at the back and away it would go into Parramatta and uh, that was cleared um, probably three times a day. Uh, now you can't do that today with a Hills bus uh, so that, that, that was an interesting feature uh, and it avoided the postal apartment having to put in letter boxes along the way uh, so that was quite a good feature. Eventually they carried mails, bagged mails, which were brought in by coach from outlying districts like uh, Kellyville and Annengrove, um, and uh, they were taken into to, to the main postal centre at Parramatta. Parcels were carried from about 1906 onwards. Um, it was quite a brisk parcel trade, uh, moving um, uh, those sorts of items from, from Parramatta up to the Hills District and vice versa. But from 
1915 onwards, the railway commissioners approved of goods being carried by tram. Um, and this uh, opened up a large measure of, of traffic for the line. Uh, there was groceries, bulk groceries carried from Parramatta and beyond up to the Hills District uh, um, to places such as Price's store and uh, Whitling's store. They, they were quite big uh, uh, grocery outlets at that time. There was bricks carried for, for, for building works. Uh, there was timber, um, all those sorts of things. But by and large, the orchardists did not patronise the good service because it was too expensive. It cost them uh, tuppence to send, or two pence to send, a case of fruit, and uh, it had to be transshipped at Parramatta Station into railway trucks to be taken into Sydney to be transshipped again to market. The tramway proved to be such a passenger success, passenger carrying success, that they, uh, despite an inquiry that was held into it, it was extended to Castle Hill by ministerial approval. Uh, and that happened in 1910, uh, with the uh, tramway being open to the public on the 1st of August 1910. The tram did lead to substantial uh, opening up of, of, of ground along its, its, its route, and uh, Darcy Hayo is one that recalls um, uh, to memory uh, that that um, was subdivided in that area. Uh, and um, it's a little different to what we see today where we wait for areas to be subdivided and then we put public transport into them. By the 1920s, the tram was carrying in excess of 1.1 million passengers a year, which is a phenomenal amount of patronage considering uh, that the district only had the population numbered in the tens of thousands. Um, so no two ways about it. The tram certainly was well patronised and was very well received by the travelling public. Despite the fact that the, the uh, tram was a, an excellent uh, convenience to the, to the general public, um, the Citrus growers in particular uh, found it an unsatisfactory work and continued to lobby for, as I've mentioned before, for a fully-fledged railway. They found uh, a willing ear around about 1919 uh, with, the, uh, with the government that, at that time. Um, there were some good friends in high places and uh, with a considerable amount of lobbying, the government finally approved for a railway to be built uh, into the Hills District. Now, it was a pinch penny railway that was planned. Uh, basically, it entailed um, putting in a, an, a, an arc of railway, so to speak, which ran from Westmead around uh, uh, through the uh, the um, uh, Westmead Boys' Home area there and the asylum area and came into uh, just north of Bryan's Road um, at North Mead. Uh, that was a new length of line. Now, from that point onwards, uh, the old tram line was to be converted uh, to railway standards. Now, the original estimates for this work was it was going to cost £11,000 uh, for the laying in of the new line of railway from Westmead to Bryan's Road and for the conversion work of the tramway uh, it was going to cost £10,000 uh, which was uh, well within the, uh, the, the the limits of the minister to approve of himself. Now the conversion meant that uh, some of the roadworks had to be re-levelled um, because the gradients on the tramway were of course a little bit too steep. Uh, but as I say, it was a pinch penny railway. There were no platforms uh, that were contemplated for it. You were going to have to go from the road level up to the up to the carriage uh, like they did in certain places in South Australia. Um, uh, there was no staff appointed for the for the line. Um, well that was all going to be done by the staff on board the train uh, as it was with the with a, with a tram. So it, it was a very mean and lean 
uh, railway that, that, that was planned. The railway uh, was ready to commence um, in 1923, um, and uh, the tram finished at midnight, uh, and the railway commenced about five or six hours later at, at first thing in the morning. Um, uh, this was on the uh, 23rd of, it's the 28th of January 1923. Uh, the tram of course was curtailed back to the woolen mills or the old woolen mills at um, uh, Bryan's Road there at North Mead and uh, the depot that had previously been built at uh, Borkham Hills uh, on the site of the bowling, present day bowling club at, um, uh, that was moved uh, dismantled and moved down to the site of Bryan's Road. Um, so that, that was interesting and that stood right up until the, uh, the 1990s I think if I remember correctly. Uh, the railway operated, it, it was a somewhat inferior service. Um, uh, the tramway had provided um, a service, basically an hourly service and that was stepped up somewhat during peak hours. Um, the railway seldom got past an hour and a half in between trains and sometimes uh, uh, it lengthened out to almost two and a half hours. Uh, so people that had been used to a very regular service of trams had to get used to this makeshift arrangement with the railways. Uh, but of course the orchardists were extremely happy because all their fruit was being loaded on uh, at um, uh, goods yards such as um, uh, installed at Borkham Hills and Castle Hill uh, and they could get their fruit to market very very quickly. Unfortunately um, by 1923 a lot of things had begun to change in the transport industry. Um, a lot more motor vehicles were on the road, in particular trucks. There were a lot more trucks were available, uh, second-hand uh, leftovers from the First World War there was a lot of unemployed uh, soldiers came back who readily got into the uh, um, getting a truck sorted out and got themselves into the carrying business. And the orchardists were starting to do one stop travelling with their fruit and in, or, or transporting of their fruit. Uh, the fruit was loaded on the truck at the orchard and taken direct into the markets in Sydney. Uh, this was found more convenient than taking it to the tra to the train at, at, at Castle Hill or, or Borkham Hills. Um, nevertheless we saw an extension of the railway made in 1924 through to, to Rogan's Hill at uh, the request of certain growers. The station at uh, Castle Hill was in the uh, Arthur Whitling Park and um, uh, there was a goods yard there, um, which was basically a loop and, and uh, a, a stub line there. Um, and of course the railway station at Rogan's Hill uh, was down behind uh, the um, uh, retirement village that is uh, there at, uh, at Rogan's Hill now. And uh, uh, that also had a goods, goods yard there. We also saw coming into road transport uh, more buses. Uh, people could just start up a bus run themselves just with the approval of the local council. Uh, they just rocked on up with an application and a petition signed by a few hundred people and the council probably approved and say yes you could run your bus uh, from A to B. Now these invariably uh, ran uh, from Castle Hill to, to uh, Parramatta principally in between the times that the train didn't run. So uh, this was uh, good for the travelling public uh, because the, the, the fares were very similar. In fact, they were even cheaper. And uh, this left the poor old railway bereft of passengers, which was most unfortunate. Um, so we see a decline happening for the railway, both with passengers and, and, and with, with goods traffic, principally fruit. There are also changes in the fruit industry. Uh, uh, fruit, um, uh, oranges in particular, were starting to be grown in the Murrumbidgee irrigation area. Uh, they were growing navels down here, down there. We were still growing Valencias up here and the trend was towards navel fruit. 
Uh, so we see in the late 1920s, we see a lot of orchards uh, pulling out their citrus and moving towards either poultry farms or, or, or soft fruits. The bus industry, of course, was unregulated. And uh, we see that uh, uh, the buses would uh, run in front of the train to start with from Parramatta or Castle Hill, pick up all the passengers en route, and uh, the train was left with nothing to pick up on. Uh, so we see enormous losses accruing for the railways um, during those years. In 1929, we saw the onset of the Great Depression, which was another blow. By 1931, the, the losses were so extensive on the railway, uh, even though by that time there had been uh, regulation brought into play regarding buses and, and truck transport, uh, the losses were such that they decided to close the line. And uh, that was done on the, uh, I think it was the last day of January 1932. Uh, fortunately, we still have a steam tram left um, out of the massive fleet that was once in Sydney. Uh, we have a steam tram motor and a trailer car that still operates today uh, at the uh, Valley Heights uh, locomotive depot. and. Um, uh, we've got uh, steam tram motor 103A and car number 93B. The interesting thing is with car 93B is that there's a uh, we have uh, on record that it was at uh, Castle Hill uh, for probably about three or four years uh, during its life, and there's a strong possibility it, it, it was on the last tram that went from Castle Hill. Uh, back to Parramatta uh, before the line was curtailed to, to the woolen mill. So that, that makes it particularly interesting for people in the Hills District, I think. Uh, but um, we, um, uh, as a society, the Steam Tram and Railway Preservation Society, uh, we operated in Parramatta Park from 1954 until uh, uh, our museum was destroyed by fire in 1993, in June of 1993. Um, uh, we found ourselves not particularly being welcome to set up again in Parramatta Park at that time. And so we had to look around for another home, uh, which we did, ranging from points as far north as Toronto to uh, Yass in the south. Uh, and uh, finally we were invited to move into the uh, uh, Locomotive Depot at Valley Heights by the Rail Transport Museum. And uh, we have a small section of line up there where we operate. and. Uh, we hope give a reasonable portrayal of, of steam trams as they were in Sydney and indeed the Hills District um, uh, from the uh, early 1900s.